Generally speaking, the overwhelming majority of video games are propelled forward by the basic human psychology of rewarding players for performing well. Because, I mean, because that just makes sense. But not all games are quite so eager to feed skilled players with a reward. Rather, they prefer to do something that basically takes them down a peg. I'm Jess from What Culture, and here are 10 video games that secretly punish you for playing well. Number 10, WWE 2K15. The entire point of career modes in wrestling games is for players to live out their squared circle fantasies in perpetuity, fighting to dominate the ring for as long as their interest sustains. But WWE 2K15's My Career Mode did things a little differently, and by differently we mean more strangely. For players who quickly ascended up the roster's pecking order and won the WWE title, my career ended up being cut unceremoniously short, as the game skips you forward untold years to your wrestler's retirement match at a future WrestleMania, after which the game effectively ends. Basically, winning the WWE title prevents you from sticking around, dominating the scene, winning other belts, and participating in iconic events like the Royal Rumble. And so you're actually better off deliberately throwing WWE title matches earlier in your career so you can prolong the experience. It's all the more bizarre given that 2K Games later confirmed it to be an intentional design choice and not an unfortunate bug. So what? why? Number 9. Medieval 2 SCE Cambridge Studio, the developers of Medieval 2, clearly relish trolling players who quite understandably expected to unlock the game's best ending by collecting each of the 20 chalices which could be found strewn throughout the world. Instead, players who went out of their way to track down all the chalices were rewarded with the decidedly bleaker of the game's two endings, an infuriating cliffhanger in which Sir Dan and his love Kia travel back in time to the end of the first game. Here they're attacked by villain Palethorn in a monstrous form, and just as the game cuts to black, that's it. That's all over. Since a third medieval game never came to fruition, that basically leaves Dan and Kia's fates forever up in the air. Compare that to the normal ending you'll get for putting in no effort at all into collecting those chalices, and in that ending Dan joins Kia in the afterlife for some well-deserved rest. The lesson here? Never assume that the ending you need to work harder to get is the better or true one. Number 8. Guitar Hero 1 and 2 One of the most basic expectations of modern video games is that if you beat a game on a higher difficulty setting, you'll also unlock all the rewards and achievements that are associated with beating it on the lower difficulties. But if you go back about 20 years, gaming wasn't quite so respectful of players' time, as is evidenced by the earlier entries in the Guitar Hero franchise. In order to access all the unlockable guitars in the first two games, you'd need to beat each game on easy, medium, hard, and expert difficulties separately. The same also applies to achievements in Guitar Hero 2. The chiefs for beating the game weren't stackable, and so clearing it on hard or expert didn't automatically pop the ones for easy and normal. Given how painfully boring Boring the easier Guitar Hero difficulties are, especially if you're used to the harder ones, that represented a lot of wasted time for capable players who still wanted to unlock everything the game had to offer. Thankfully, Guitar Hero 3 finally made achievements stackable, eliminating all that snoozy busywork. Number 7. Undertale Undertale is admittedly centrally preoccupied with sending up the very notion of modern video games as we know them. And so, if you thought the Thunder Snail racing minigame was going to be a merely conventional experience, you'd be dead wrong. You're tasked with encouraging a yellow snail across the racetrack by mashing buttons whenever the exclamation mark isn't above his head. But if you get a little bit too enthusiastic for your own good and mash too much, the snail will keel over and set on fire because of course. That's not the end of it though. Even if you manage to win the race, you'll end up receiving just 9 gold, despite the race hilariously costing 10 gold to enter. And so the only way to actually turn a profit on the race is to lose by a slim margin. This will prompt organizer Napster Bluke to give you 30 gold out of sympathy. To recap, button mashing like your life depends on it kills the snail, actually winning the race loses you money, and only by losing can you get paid. Undertale gonna Undertale. Number 6. The Sims In the original version of The Sims, one of the player's primary goals was to progress their Sims' careers up to the maximum level of 10 for some serious financial prosperity and happiness. 
Seems simple, right? Not quite. The problem is reaching level 10 introduces a major element of chance that after returning home from work, there's the possibility that your successful sim will be suddenly moved to an entirely different career track and demoted down many levels. This is obviously an attempt by developers Maxis to keep the game fresh and interesting for players who seem to have finished it off, but it'll also end up immediately impacting your sim's financial standing, taking them from a high up position to a mid tier one in a new field. So it actually makes sense for players to intentionally keep their sims at level nine, denying them the requirements to reach 10 so they can keep the fat stacks rolling in hassle free. Number five, Metal Gear Solid. If you're nimble fingered enough to survive the infamous button mashing torture session in the middle of Metal Gear Solid, you might expect some commendation for your efforts, but it ultimately only ends up depriving you of the best post game reward. You see, surviving the torture will unlock a bandana for your second playthrough an item which grants the player unlimited ammo. As neat and nifty as that might sound, it pales massively in comparison to what you get if you fail the torture sequence. Succumb to torture and you'll unlock stealth camouflage for your next run through, allowing you to effortlessly bypass all non-boss level enemies and waltz through the majority of the game undetected. It's an extremely fun and useful item, and yet one oddly given to players who perform less well on a button mashing minigame. By comparison, infinite ammo can't help but seem a little bit average. And so for those who survived the torture and still wanted to get the stealth camo, they had to play through the game a second time or revert to an earlier save, willingly fail the torture sash, and only then they'd be good to go for their third go around. Number four, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Early on in my favorite RPG of all time, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, you'll take part in a swoop racing minigame. Potentially my least favorite phrase of all time. This is while you're searching for Bastila, but be warned, don't do too well at it. Basically, once you beat the listed par time, another racer will complete the circuit and beat that time, forcing you to go back and beat the new time, which is, again, even less than the first time you did really well. The problem is if you set an extremely good race time from the outset, it can be close to impossible to improve on it enough to beat the new set time, effectively making you a victim of your own skillful driving. And so you actually need to pull back a bit and only beat the par time by a thin margin to ensure you'll be able to better it on your next time up to bat. Hell, this pissed off enough people that a mod was released which allowed players to cheese their way through each of the game's swoop races for the sake of our collective blood pressure. And boy did I wish I knew about this mod when I replayed both games last year. Number three, Raven Skull. A deepest of deep cuts now with 1986's graphic adventure game Raven Skull, which tasks players with defending the village of Ostberg and retrieving a stolen silver crucifix, which has been split into four parts and scattered throughout the game's four levels. The player's performance is graded on a percentage scale, but this ultimately serves up a major drawback for cream of the crop players. These are the people who managed to complete a perfect run through the game by accomplishing every single possible task. In a massive designer of site, the game only keeps track of two digits, meaning that if you do actually get 100% completion, the game will perceive it to be a 0% of completion and therefore deny you the win. So if you want to beat the game legitimately, the most skilled Raven Skull players need to intentionally miss a task or two to ensure that the busted game counter keeps track of all their hard work. For anyone nostalgic for the era when developers couldn't release a broken product and later fix it up with patches, consider fresh nonsense like this. Number two, Hades. As universally acclaimed as roguelike action RPG Hades is, there were some players who complained that they ended up feeling punished through their ability to beat the game uncommonly quickly. Those skilled enough to prevail against the final boss Hades after just a small number of runs will basically end up missing a ton of lore, interactions, dialogue, and general world building, all of which fleshes the game out considerably. And beyond that, it can result in dialogue triggers being awkwardly placed, meaning that that even the plot and character information that you do end up hearing seems haphazardly thrown into the mix. Evidently, developer Supergiant Games didn't count on many, if any, players getting through it quite so fast. Basically, unless you really have a good reason to rush through the game and move on to your next game of choice, you're definitely advised to chill and take your time getting to the end, because you'll get a far more complete feeling experience. Number one, Sonic the Hedgehog. 
And finally, here's one for the speedrunners of you. Generally speaking, speedrunners want to race through levels as fast as possible, but in the case of Sonic the Hedgehog, you can actually end up being a little too fast for your own good. The reason for that being, beating any of the game stages in under 30 seconds will reward players with a score bonus of 50,000 points. Now that sounds great, but it takes roughly 8 seconds to be added to a player's total score. And so in many instances, it's actually beneficial to be a few seconds slower, as taking 30 seconds or more only gives the players 10,000 points, which takes just two seconds to be added to the player's score a whole six seconds faster. Now, the minutia of seconds saved obviously doesn't matter to casual Sonic players, but for those who are desperate to shave every possible nanosecond off the game clock in pursuit of their personal best, or world best, it's often worth it to be strategically slower. Strange, but makes sense, I guess.